The first lecture of the course is called Scientific Methods. We are going to be looking at uh, what that means and how we can use the scientific method to uh, conduct an experiment. Um, by the end of the lecture, you should be able to um, come up with a testable hypothesis. You should be able to set up uh, an experiment to test that hypothesis and um, be able to look at the various variables um, that you need to change or not change in an experiment. Uh, and that's something that we're going to be doing uh, later on in the course um, in one of your, your, your labs. So this is introductory biology, uh, of course. Um, um, let's take a look at what exactly biology is. Yeah. So biology is the um, scientific study of, of living things, scientific study of living things. Now there are um, uh, many different uh, branches of biology. Okay? Um, for example, there is anatomy, which is the study of body structures, right? Basically anatomy um, would be, you know, what was it called, okay? So the name of uh, the various body parts. Right? Uh, physiology is the study of the functions uh, uh, of structures in the body. Um, so basically, physiology is how how does it work? Right? So um, this course, the um, introductory um, biology, uh, is going to be the prerequisite for um, the, your, your anatomy and physiology course next semester, right, where you'll be learning at the names of various body structures as well as how they work. Um, we have histology. My histology is the study of uh, cells and tissues. So here you can see um, this is a, a typical uh, slide. Um, you can prepare uh, from, say, a biopsy. Right? Biopsy is like a tissue sample that you take from someone. Right? This you're looking at the kidney here, actually. Um, so based on the histology, based on the um, uh, how the cells and the tissue look like under the microscope, uh, an oncologist, for example, can determine whether or not the person has a benign tumor, which is not harmful typically, or, or if the person has cancer, right? So that's histology. We'll be looking at some microscope slides in uh, the second semester so you can see what, you know, normal tissue looks like. Um, there's also genetics, for example. Genetics is a study of uh, heredity. Um, we um, pass our genetic information to our next generation through um, DNA um, so we can look at um, uh, you know what's the probability of your child uh, having uh, 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 you know type A blood right uh, for example that's an example of genetics um, people can do genetic counseling to see what's the probability that their child is going to have um, say cystic fibrosis right uh, and that might um, help people make an informed uh, decision of whether or not they want to have kids in some cases. So if biology is the scientific study of living things, um, then it's worth thinking about what exactly are living things. I mean, it's kind of intuitive, right? Like if I ask you, um, is, a, is a zebra a living thing or a non-living thing? You should be able to tell me that it's living, right? Same thing for like flower, trees, dragonflies and whatnot, right? And if I ask you if the teddy bear is living or not, then yeah, you're going to tell me that it's, it's a non-living thing. Uh, but uh, when it comes to something like, like a virus, right, then it's a little bit tricky. Right? If you haven't thought about this before, um, you know, it, it's a virus, a living thing or a non-living thing. Right? You might argue that it's a living thing because uh, it can make people sick uh, and it's able to grow in someone's uh, body, right? Uh, but then other people can argue that it's not a living thing because it's not able to grow and replicate outside of a living organism, right? So sometimes it's not as clear cut um, whether something is living or not. Uh, and, you know, it would be nice to kind of come up with a set of um, uh, characteristics uh, that are shared by all living things. So although life um, takes many forms, but all living things share a common set of characteristics, right? So even though the poison dart frog here looks very different than the Portuguese men of war, right? They actually share a set of um, characteristics that classify them as a living thing. So what, what are these characteristics? Well, first of all, um, all living things exhibit complex but ordered organization, right? So order is a characteristic of living things, right? If you look at 
um, or an arc butterfly, for example, um, there is going to be symmetry in it. Uh, if you look at uh, a seashell, right, the spiral actually has a fixed ratio uh, uh, in terms of the distance from the center uh, to the outward spiral. Right? Flowers, uh, the number of petals are almost always the same uh, in the same uh, species. And, you know, these kind of orderly organization uh, is not just um, on the uh, organism level. They continue to exist even at a cellular level, right? So here you are looking at uh, the transport system of a, of a plant, and you can see it's quite uh, organized even at um, at a cellular microscopic level. Uh, now this organization uh, uh, actually started at the uh, atomic level uh, and it continues to build all the way to the organism level, right? So this is what we call the hierarchy of organization uh, uh, from the atomic level all the way, again, to the entire organisms, right? So we can see um, uh, atoms will come together to form molecules. Uh, and molecules will come together to form macromolecules and so on and so forth, right? And that's kind of like the first half of the course, right? Um, we are going to be looking at, uh, uh, you know, some chemistry that are related to uh, a biological system, uh, how we have key molecules that built us. For example, uh, we have proteins, right, that build our muscles, right? We um, are going to have some carbohydrates, right, carbs um, that we use uh, for energy, right? Our, our genetic material, all these are considered as macromolecules, right? Uh, and we depend on them to uh, to, to, to survive. Uh, and then uh, we will continue up this hierarchy of organization to, um, uh, to the uh, organ system level, right? Um, that will link us to the, uh, the next course. So second characteristics, okay? Um, the second char characteristics of living things is the ability to maintain homeostasis, okay? So homeostasis, uh, basically means uh, maintain an internal internal balance right so of course the environment around us changes uh, constantly right? it gets cold it gets hot right uh, if you are um, you know a, a fish for example living in the ocean uh, then the salinity might change right it might be salty at one place this might be not as salty um, the pH might change in the environment so all these changes happens we must be able to maintain some kind of internal balance um, that ability to do so it's a characteristic of living things right and we call that homeostasis right so to maintain that internal balance sometimes we are going to have physiological mechanisms so these are things that your body does um, to uh, to reset the balance uh, and uh, the uh, example uh, the easiest example for this would be when you're cold uh, your body might shiver right so shivering um, is muscle contraction and that generates heat uh, and that will uh, warm you up um, and if you are hot right um, you might sweat right so the reason dogs they stick their tongue out uh, all the time in their pants is you know when they're hot the pan thing actually cause the saliva to evaporate from their tongues uh, and that will cool them off so uh, another example is if you're bleeding right, it will um, stop the bleeding should stop within three to five minutes um, and this blood clotting uh, is a physiological mechanism that allows you to uh, uh, maintain homeostasis okay uh, sometimes there's a behavioral mechanism so um, I think again right if you're cold your body will shiver but that's not enough sometimes that's not enough to warm you up so um, you might put on a jacket right uh, you might you know go indoor right you might start a fire or warm yourself up so all these things are behavioral mechanism it's things that you do uh, uh, in addition to your body uh, response to try to regain that balance right so here we have a lizard uh, uh, a lizard is cold-blooded um, which means they don't maintain uh, a constant body temperature like us, right? Humans, we try to keep our body uh, at 37 degrees uh, Celsius uh, at all times, but they're cold-blooded, right? They cannot um, maintain a constant body temperature. So uh, if it's too cold, right, a behavioral mechanism they would have uh, is to 
you know, basically sun, take, take, a, take a sun bath, right? They would stay uh, in a hot area, right? They would climb up to a rock uh, and just let the sun warm them up, right? So physiological, something your body does like shivering. Behavioral, something that you choose to do, um, such as putting on a jacket when it's cold. Another characteristic of all living things is the ability to grow and to develop. Okay, we, um, depending on the organism you're looking at, um, they would go through different stages of growth and development from birth to adults, right? Uh, humans, we start off as like mini versions of us and eventually we become full grown adults. Uh, but so for some, uh, something like a, like a butterfly, they have complicated life cycle. They start off as a caterpillar, um, become a cocoon, and then the butterfly emerges from the cocoon, right? For uh, chickens, for example, ducks, um, they start off as an egg. Uh, and they hatch from the egg, right? So there are different modes of growth, um, and you know we certainly develop differently. Uh, but the key thing is, all living things uh, will 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 do that. Uh, another characteristic is we need energy. Okay, we need energy. Um, so some organisms are carnivorous; they eat other um, animals. Some organisms are herbivores; they eat uh, uh, plants primarily. Uh, and we have things like fungus that are uh, decomposers; they grow on uh, decaying matters to get energy. Uh, it doesn't matter how you obtain the energy; uh, the fact that you need to. Uh, have a food source right, um, uh, to generate energy. Um, that is a characteristic of all of all living things. Um, this is kind of related to um, to homeostasis, right? Um, homeostasis again is maintaining an internal balance despite the fact that the environment is changing. So in order for you to um, be able to uh, 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 detect that change, right, um, and and respond to it accordingly. Uh, um, is is key to uh, maintaining homeostasis. So uh, responding to stimulus, right? Stimulus is like a it's like an environmental trigger, right? Some kind of change, right? Some kind of change or trigger, right? That you can detect. Right? This would be a uh, 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 characteristic of all living things. So, for example, like a Venus flytrap, right? Uh, they would have their flaps open I guess uh, and when a bug goes in uh, that's a stimulus and that will cause it to 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 close right that is the response to the stimulus right if you think about uh, us if you uh, touch something sharp right then your hand uh, recoil removes uh, from that pointy object um, as, as a reflex right that is a response to a stimulus right so again in this case the stimulus would be the sharp object and the response to it would be removing your hand right typically that that response that you have to the to the stimulus is a is a key uh, uh, initial uh, uh, response to maintaining um, homeostasis within within the body uh, and then we have the ability to reproduce, right? Reproduction is another characteristic of living things. Um, and all cells contain genetic materials, right? Uh, in the form of DNA, and that uh, enables every organism to produce its own kind, right? So um, panda is going to make baby pandas, polar bear is going to make baby polar bears, and we humans make um, baby humans. Uh, last but not least, um, another characteristic of living things is the ability to adapt and evolve. So populations evolve over time uh, in a way that makes them more adaptable um, to the environment. And this enhanced uh, adaptability will often uh, cause them to survive better in that environment. So uh, if you think about a hummingbird, right, the beak is really, really long, uh, and that's an adaptation for them to get the nectar from uh, from a certain type of flowers, right? And you know, I'm gonna try to draw that flower here. That flower has a really, really deep um, uh, uh, pocket, I guess. I'm not sure what that's called. Uh, and and there is the flower. And in order for the hummingbird to get the nectar from it, it needs the very long beak, right? So that's an adaptation. It takes time uh, for it to evolve. Um, in this picture, there there is a seahorse there, right? The color allows it to blend in uh, with the environment, and you know, uh, presumably they're not going to be eaten as easily. Uh, that's an adaptability. 
uh, that enhances their their survival. It's important to understand that uh, individuals do not evolve. Okay, so if you think of like a like a like a human, uh, uh, we we cannot just evolve and and like have wings or something like in the movies, right? Um, the the entire population evolves slowly over time. Um, we don't have time to go into evolution um, in this course, but I thought uh, it would be good to mention that. Uh, distinction here. So there you have it, uh, the seven characteristics of uh, of living things. Now, if you um, have downloaded the study guides, right, it's good for you to uh, uh, get to the study guides and perhaps uh, fill it in here yourself um, so that you have a, a, a good copy of, um, of what they are. So now we have a look at the characteristic of living things. Let's go back to um, the definition of biology. It is the scientific study of living things. Let's look at what scientific study uh, means. So science, what's science? The word science is actually derived from Latin words. A lot of words we use in science are actually derived from Latin. Uh, but the word science itself is also derived from Latin, uh, meaning to know. So science is a way of understanding uh, based on uh, inquiry, based on us asking questions, right? We as human beings are by nature uh, uh, curious. We're curious about ourselves. We're curious about uh, uh, the world around us, right? If you um, have a kid at home, like, I mean, I have a three-year-old uh, uh, at home and she asks me all these questions, right? Why, why is the sky blue? Uh, why is there a rainbow? Why do I have a belly button? Right? So all these things are basically uh, uh, human curiosity, right? Um, uh, about the things that are going on uh, either to ourselves or to the world around us. And, and it's because of this um, uh, curiosity, of this in inquiry, that's what's driving uh, the process of science. So there are two main scientific approaches that are going um, that are being used. Uh, first one is what we call uh, uh, discovery science, and then we have what's called uh, hypothesis-driven science. Now these two things are not necessarily uh, completely separate, uh, independent of each other. They actually are uh, quite connected, uh, and one will often lead to the other. Let's start with discovery science. Discovery science involves studying a system without changing it in any way. For example, uh, studying global warming by observations. Uh, another example would be astronomy. Right? You look at the sun, you look at the planets, the stars, um, you are just observing. You cannot change what you're observing uh, in, in any way. Um, that's the basis of discovery science. Now, the observations we make can be qualitative or quantitative. In qualitative uh, uh, observations, um, we uh, are, are using our senses. Right? So we use our sight, uh, our our hearing, our touch, uh, uh, smell, taste. Although we shouldn't really be tasting things in the lab, but sometimes you know you have to taste things in a safe environment, uh, and that's part of your qualitative uh, uh, observations. Right? Um, these observations tend to be uh, descriptive. Right? Um, we would say the surface feels um, smooth, coarse, uh, rough, right? These are words that we use to describe um, uh, uh, things. Um, but when it comes to senses, um, human senses are kind of limited compared to, say, other animals. Um, so we, we use tools to extend our senses. Um, tools such as microscope allows us to see things that uh, we wouldn't uh, be able to see uh, otherwise. Uh, quantitative uh, observations are measurements so these are things that we measure with tools right how long uh, is something how big is something how heavy uh, what's the density right so these are uh, numbers um, uh, related uh, and and because of that um, they tend to be a little bit more objective right whereas qualitative observation can be subjective at times right if you um, you know, ask uh, a person how how does this sample smell like? Um, they might say it smells uh, it smells good, right? It smells very uh, 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 sweet, right? Um, but exactly, what does what does good mean? What does uh, sweet mean, right? It might be very different for another person, right? So uh, uh, here, uh, if you're looking at uh, bacteria, these are bacteria under the microscope, the red 
red rods, uh, and you want to know how long they are, um, then we can use a, a, a predetermined uh, 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 measuring method um, to do just that. And you know, um, this would not vary from a person to person uh, because of that um, standard that we have um, of what 10 micrometer means. So discovery science can lead to important conclusions based on a type of logic uh, called inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning. Right? So inductive reasoning uh, um, is a, a generalization that we make uh, based on uh, many, many smaller uh, uh, observations. Okay? So typically speaking, inductive uh, reasoning flows from specific cases to general cases. Right? So an example uh, would be all organisms are made of cells. Right? So uh, we make many, many observations uh, that uh, many different things are made up of cells. So let's say they look at they look at um, they look at uh, bacteria. Okay, so bacteria is made of cell. Okay, they look at uh, fungus. Fungus is made of cell. They look at uh, 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 humans. Human is made of cell. Dogs is made of cells. And then they look at many, 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 many different organisms, and uh, it looks like they are made up of cells. So uh, we take all these specific cases and we come up with a general statement and say um, all organisms are made of cells. Okay, so here uh, is just a picture of. Um, various organisms living in ponds uh, and since they are living organisms uh, and all organisms made of cells then we can conclude that they too are made uh, of cells so after you make a bunch of observations uh, in discovery science um, then that will uh, usually result in um, people asking some questions about what they are seeing when they try to look for an explanation. Right? So for example, back to global warming, um, if people see a big uh, hole in the ozone through satellite imagery, right? the next question, uh, the next logical step would be to ask, why is there a big hole? Right? How did it form? Right? Why is it getting bigger? Why is it getting smaller? So on and so forth. Right. So the uh, scientific method, which is what this lecture is about uh, is a series of steps that are used as a formal process of inquiry right? and any studies uh, that are conducted using the scientific method uh, is what we call the hypothesis driven science so just to go back quickly right um, we were talking about two main scientific approaches right discovery science uh, is making the observations right qualitative quantitative measurements uh, observations uh, and then from those observations it will typically lead to hypothesis driven science which is something uh, that happens when we use the scientific method um, to drive the process of inquiry so hypothesis, right? A hypothesis uh, is uh, a key component of the scientific method, uh, and, and what is it? Is uh, it is a proposed answer to the question that we are asking, right? uh, a proposed explanation for the observations. Right? So uh, 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 that proposed uh, answer is not necessarily the correct answer. After all, if we knew what the right answer uh, is, we wouldn't be asking the question in the first place, right? Um, so a lot of time, you know, people call a hypothesis an educated guess, right? And that guess might be correct, we don't know, or, but very often it is not. <laughs>